This episode is sponsored by Chill Tech, a leading provider in high quality American made LED lights. If you're tired of dealing with low quality LEDs that fail to deliver, well, then you need to check out Chill Tech's state of the art LEDs. These lights are engineered to deliver superior performance and energy efficiency, making them the perfect choice for any home grower. Their commitment to excellence is reflected in every product they produce. So whether you're looking for better efficacy or just to upgrade the build overall, make sure you check out ChillTech. They got the perfect solution for you. Visit fromthestash.com slash LED and use discount code thestash15 at checkout to save yourself a little bit of money on a new ChillTech LED. Hey, welcome back to From the Stash Podcast. It's your boy Rob, Mr. Grow It, and Pigeon420, and your boy Wink on the ones and twos. We're here, boys. <laughs> it feels really weird, but really good. Right. Be here every time, like feels great to do it like this in person. Yeah. Yeah. Another week, so much better. Another, Another week. week. This is good. Yeah. We got a good conversation in store today, don't we, boys? Yeah, yeah. Environment, yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah. You know, we before we get too uh, far on the environment, I just want to give a big shout out to the people back here, AC Infinity, for helping with our environment. Because I know for me, my environment's changed significantly since I went from the manual to the automated, proper dialed in system. So big shout out AC Infinity. You can use the discount code the Stash fifteen at checkout or just the Stash, right? St- from the stash from the stash that one that's the other <laughs> one check it out link will be below in the uh description of the video if you're watching on youtube if you're in audio rewind it back and listen and i got a feeling that we're gonna touch on their products a couple times throughout yeah. this episode because environment is extremely important yep. and it seems as if uh actually there's actually it, there's quite a few companies that are kind of getting on board of having a little bit of everything now mm. but ac infinity uh one of the first to give you almost everything complete in the garden to give you control over your environment. Yeah. Well, I think the environment slept on too. People think it's always just genetics, genetics, genetics. And I, I say it like constantly. I'm, I literally will preach it to people. Like it's all about the genetics, it's genetics. But you can give somebody the best genetics and they can't fully get the best characteristics because their environment's not dialed in. So if you don't have these key things in place, it doesn't matter about your genetics. It doesn't matter about if you got a cut, if you got seeds, whatever you got. You really have to dial it in first to make sure you're bringing this in to the right place, you know? So, Chris, you've got probably the most crippling situation in terms of environment, I'd say, uh, in terms of lack of humidity. We, uh, pigeons and I, you know, from Michigan for me and Canada for pigeons, we got swinging uh, temperature and humidity and things like that. You pretty much just have swinging temperature. Humidity stays really low. How do you maintain to be able to keep what your plant needs? Do you focus heavy on having genetics that deal with the environment, or do you make sure you optimize your environment for the genetics? Well, uh, well, first off, this <laughs> this environment topic. I want to clarify this before we move on. Is we we've filmed this before, right? Back in 2020, late 2020. So it's going to be interesting to see what's different here versus two years ago. I think some of my stuff's going to be the same, like temperature. Um, usually aim for about 82 Fahrenheit. Uh, lights on, and then you know around 70 ish for lights off. I don't know if that's really changed. What do you guys usually aim for? I'll park the same. I think the difference with, with mine being in the winter time, I'm trying to heat my space a little more. So I'll sacrifice having a slightly hotter heat. You know, hotter, hotter heat. heat. Hotter <laughs> yeah. heat. That's good. A I hot, hate that cold heat. Hotter heat. <laughs> <laughs> it really <laughs> strikes. It seems to, uh, overall, my plants perk up more. You know, there is a difference in the winter. I, <coughs> excuse me. I misspoke in another episode saying something about how I was a little arrogant, too. I watched it back. I was like, oh, doesn't matter. Everybody says your environment. This and that, you know, inside, outside, doesn't matter where you live. Dial in your environment. That's how you get it better. It's true. But I don't have as many concerns as, you know, lack of humidity like you would. Mm. So you have yeah, to do Yeah, I dodged your work. question there. I forget what I... Forget. <laughs> you completely... <laughs> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it's more like, do you, do you optimize your environment for the genetic or do you optimize your genetic for the environment? Do you bring something I, in that is more used to the desert climate? I usually just aim for, like, the VPD numbers... And you know what I mean? Naturally, my environment, as long as I'm adding humidity in, because like you said, low humidity where I live, as long as I'm adding that humidity and I can get up to like VPD numbers, like dark green range or whatever, depending on what temperature I'm kind of aiming for. So, and I just kind of, it's hard for me to like, because I grow out so many different cultivars, it's hard for me to say, oh, I know this genetic is going to grow great in this temperature and humidity. You know, it's hard for me to say. So I just try to stick in that VPD range and then see like what the morphology of the plant is from there, you know? Speaking so I'm kind of like with you, or it's like, you know, as long as you're, it seems like somewhat of a broad range you can be in for temperature, humidity, and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, we don't monocrop. We're not monocroppers. If mm. we just grew the same cultivar consistently, it'd probably be easier to have just the exact same recipe. But because all of a sudden I pull in this genetic that 
seemingly thrives more in a hotter temperature with less humidity, I have to change my whole room up. But then it doesn't work for the other cultivars that, let's say, want the opposite. Mm. So it's like, depending on how you grow, I think that's a big thing. You've grown out that same cultivar multiple times and you know. Yeah. I was going right. to say, you, you, it, you, with the phenotypes, you know, you're going to have you, one cultivar is going to be great, grow the same thing again in a different, and you got a different pheno, and it's not going to react very well to a drier climate, you know? Um, now we're throwing words around here that I feel like our regular <laughs> viewers, people who've been here for a while, you guys probably know what we're talking about, but pheno, VPD, these are things that are like almost slang to people, you know? <laughs> With pheno, um, that's when I see it's a lot of debate in terms of phenotype and genotype. Mm. I, I hear people a lot of argument over that, but essentially my layman's terms and bro science breakdown of a phenotype is uh, the unique characteristics that a specific cultivar has within itself. So if you've got one seed, it doesn't mean that they're all going to have the same characteristics. They can have a variety of them per seed. It's almost like if you've got a sibling, same parents, just a little different from you, you may be a lot cooler than your, your sibling. Parents may like you better than your sibling, but your other sibling may live longer <laughs> and have better and more produced better. <laughs> so there's these things that, like, there's more characteristics that are more favorable to one side than the other potentially, or you like them all, you know. Totally bro science breakdown of it, but what, what do you guys look at for phenotype? What, what is that, uh, uh, environmentally I, driven? I'm in the same way, too. It's a, a plant it and chuck it kind of deal for me. So it's not looking for... Uh, anything particular from any given cultivar. Mine are very general, you know, uh, phenotypes. I, you know, it's like I'm looking for good solid grows, you know, resistant to bugs. Uh, it's going to be something that's going to be squat. I don't like growing tall. So, yeah, um, it's very characteristic for me. Um, but a lot of that can be less about genetics and more on environment. You know, you could you could have a, some, a, a, plant, a plant that's going to grow squat, but if you have your if you've got your light too high up or too dim or you've got you're using CFLs or T5s and you're trying to get it to late flower that squat plant could probably stretch out for you so it is genetics 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 but you can have the best genetics in the game but if your environment is drying up and or it's way too moist too hot too cold your genetics aren't going to cut it you know and well, so a lot of big variables there when well, that's, I think, the phenotype conversation, not that we'll dive into that, but is it the environmental effect on the particular cultivar that's sh showing these characteristics, or is it just naturally that characteristic from the particular seed, just like it would be a baby, is a little different based on this amount of X, Y, Z, you know? Mm -hmm. I really think that that drives more, in my opinion, I see in still in the grow. We were talking earlier, uh, a, couple, a couple of weeks ago, we'll say, about an episode, uh, you know, growing a particular cultivar under HID in the commercial setting versus the home grow in the LED setting. There's other variables that come into play, but the environmental impact and how that particular cultivar grows is like a phenotype expression, you know? So I think that's where that argument comes into play where genotype versus phenotype, but that, that's such a huge factor with your environment because you could say that like, oh, Cindy99 loves this, this, and this, but this particular phenotype doesn't. Hmm. So now you have to really change your entire approach Versus just, oh, well, this is the general rule of thumb. Environment should have this humidity, this temperature, this VPD we're hitting. That's another one, VPD. I say this a lot. Vapor pressure deficit. Vapor pressure deficit. That's a, a real science that a lot of people have been using as a bro science, I feel, of just matching a chart. But <laughs> it actually goes to a real science. You know what I'm saying? It's the most simple version of it. If you want to maybe break it down a little bit, we're talking about it outside. Yeah, I mean, vapor pressure deficit measured in KPA, kilopascals. Um, I, I don't have them all memorized, but here's... I. I'm going to pull up a cheat sheet, you know what I mean? Like, That's why we got them. Here we right, are. Right. So like KPA for clone seed lengths, 0.6 to 1.0. This is according to Pulse Monitor, by the way. Shout out to Pulse. I know a lot of you guys run their monitors. Um, good stuff. They have a really good page with all this information. Veg, 0.8 to 1.2 KPA, and then flower, 1.2 to 1.5 KPA. But I'm one of the people that you had mentioned is looking at the chart. What's the <laughs> yeah. temperature at? Okay, what yeah, humidity should I be at? And there's the dark green range, which is like the most optimal. And then there's the lighter green range with, within the dark green range or outside the dark green range. And a lot of people say that's fine. That's like a 10 degree swing at all, you know, yeah. sometimes and stuff like that. And then there's obviously the orange range. And, you know, the more green it is, the more ideal humidity it is for the plant stomata to open up, you know transpiration purposes kind of like uh like people compare it to us breathing right? humans breathe yeah. plants their version of breathing is transpiration so just kind of having that uh stomata open yeah, they I think say that's it leads like, to better growth faster growth more optimal growth so 
that's, that's VPD. That's why a lot of manipulate people manipulate the environment, though, for the crop better. steering. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, exactly. Yeah. People are hot very word. against that. Yeah, crop <laughs> crop steering. Is a it's thing. like people throw that word around. Yeah. And it's like we're all like kind of messing around with our environment to make things better, and that's pretty much what crop steering is. Yeah, <laughs> we're manipulating to steer the direction of the crop, and in this case, like plant training, uh, environmental shifts, um, how long you veg plant, even like these technically are all that. But I think when you're looking at your environment. There's a, a, a make or break point where it's like you become over the top with it where everything is like analytical and perfect or there's kind of let it go and it do its thing. And I've had too many times where each phase doesn't have the optimal VPD and I don't get the best growth versus when it's tightened up and it's done right, you notice a difference. It's like a steroid growth. It really, like you can see, same with hitting the right EC, you know, with feeding. When you really dial stuff in and you don't just try to bro science it, you can really see that difference in your plant, especially a side by side. You're like, whoa. It's like double the size. I did nothing different. It's like, well, I just dialed it in. I did stuff more scientifically instead of just bro science. And I'm a total victim of my own arrogance sometimes where I'm like, this plant did great. So I'm going to put another genetic in here and assume it's going to follow suit and do great. And I'm like, why is this one so small? Why didn't this produce? Good smoke, but it's small. It's like, she wanted a different environment. Mm. She wanted, you know, in particular, this chemistry seems to like a little bit cooler temperatures. As we're headbanger, I could let it get pretty hot in there. Mm. No problem. But it's like I have three other cultivars in that space that totally are fine with what my environment currently is. So it's one of those things where it's like, do I call the herd? Do I monocrop a certain room? Do I crop steer? Try to make it work for me? I think the environment is such a crucial thing for your room because you can literally get a pest or disease based on if it's too bad. And if it's too good per se, it seems like I don't get the best results. It's almost more when I do the hippie way of things like beating the plant up and not being too anal about it, I get better results. But when I'm in there constantly, I don't get nearly as good of results. But if you don't have a tent or a closed-in space that's temperature uh, sealed and everything, you can't control your environment. It's only for that single time when you're running the equipment. You know? What about CO2? I don't use CO2. Uh, I kind of feel as if I don't have my environment totally sealed um, from airflow. Mm. So I'm more worried about if I was to put co2 in my garden that i'm going to be wasting it mm. you know i run my ac my inline fan at like six out of ten which is pretty quick gotta exhaust that heat right right i do and so exhaust i just that co2 in the CO2. same process yeah. yeah right and that's just it so and i think in a lot of cases when people are thinking about using co2 they're in closets you know they're, they're in rooms that aren't even sealed and in my opinion you you don't need it if in that in that case, because you're, you, it's just going through the walls, you know. Um, have you guys ever used? Have you ever used CO2? I did when I was in a bigger grow space. I used CO2 for a while, but I was also running HPS lights. So I feel like because of the intensity, I had to. Now there there is some science where like increasing the CO2 can increase the uh, the strength, I guess, of the plant where it can obtain more, whether it be food or nutrients, or food or nutrients, food or <laughs> or light. But I, I felt like my plants would get foxtailish and get big fat like knuckly buds but it wouldn't increase the trichomes of the terpene i think there's no doubt that co2 is an advantage to your plants there, there's no, no real beneficial, well, yeah. what's, beneficial. The, what's the ambient co2 you already have in your your space depending on where right. you're at and, it and, should be kind of big right you know? right and that's kind of what i'm saying yeah. like, co2 is an advantage i just think that either most people are either under utilizing it or over utilizing yeah it. I, I just there's a lot of cases where i, I just don't think you need it in, uh, in the case where your garden's yeah. not sealed. It's a, it depends on what type of person you are, right? If you're just a small home grower, like, I mean, me, I I live in the house where I grow, and that's enough CO2 for the plants that I'm growing. You know, I'm growing 6 to 12 plants. Yeah, you know, well, too like, much can be dangerous, too. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, that's the thing people don't think about. They think pump it more and more and more. It's like, it's not good for humans, man. Like, you yep. can't just keep throwing that out. I know people who have CO2 burners, yep. and they'll run that thing like crazy. A lot of times they'll shut off their ventilation when they're doing this. So I'm like, man... What are you doing? Are you measuring this properly? Luckily, most of them are, but these are also people running super high intense lights. Mm. So the difference I feel like is depending on what you have for equipment you're running or how hard you're pushing your plants. CO2 may not be necessary, but if you have the capability to do it, I've never seen great crazy results from like the bags or the bottles. Like they work, but I almost feel like it's placebo. Like I don't have an exact measurement. I'm just like, yeah, maybe plants bigger. It's like well, it's different genetics. Yeah. I I use the bags and I use the canisters. Uh, for a while, both of those. And I have a CO2 monitor in there, so I'm able to kind of just see the CO2 levels as far as like measuring the plant biomass or anything like that. Like, 
I didn't even bother to go that far again. I'm just a small home grower, but I had fun with it, just experimenting a little bit. And I live in the house I, you know, I grow in, so I don't need to, you know, yeah, really do it. Like I get a sufficient harvest for myself without CO2, without adding it in. But when I was using the canisters and the um, the mushroom bags, um, I had it like intermittent exhausting, so it would kind of fill up the room. You see, like you know, up and down ppm levels is what I'm trying to say because. CO2 ppm levels, so that's the measurement for it. And um, so I'd see it upwards of, you know, 1,200, you know, with those, but sometimes see it down to 800. So it's like no consistency. I wish I had it, like, on my phone app so I could yeah. see the the graph. We don't have that technology yet. Yeah. But uh, – AC Infinity. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Some <laughs> hey, technology. Maybe Someone's going to come to get it. it. Maybe that will happen. Message. But um, yeah. Yeah, there's so many studies out there, four, uh, 1,400 ppm. 30% uh, increase in biomass. So that's one of the studies I know of. There's a bunch of studies just talking about the increase in biomass when you're supplementing CO2. So I the, don't know if proof is more there. biomass, though. What's that? It's more plant material? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Bigger flowers. Big, yeah. yeah, generally. The the more, again, the more science shows that's the worst part of weed, even though I like it. <laughs> that's the worst part of the plant. Well, I think, like, no, no, biologic, like that's the whole well, thing in general. So that essentially yeah. the... The buds, the flowers would be larger too. It's weird because in the commercial space, when you sell trim or shake to people, it's called biomass, hmm. right? Because they can't. It's kind of like anything waste. else. Yeah, right. But it's like again, like the focus is: do we think 2008? I just want buds as big as my arm that smoke like mm-hmm. shit, or do I want high quality bud that has the best characteristics as possible? And I think I start with optimizing my environment before I add an additional thing to it. Mm-hmm. Personally, you know, if it's easy enough where you can go in your room and talk to your plants, be that kind of person. Start with that, and then if anything, invest in the the tool to measure your actual PPM in there. Then, if you're seeing it's it's inadequate, then maybe try adding more to it. I think to start off with it, assuming that oh, I got to have this bust in at its full potential, so I'm killing it. Grow, learn how to grow good weed first, you know, because I I know for myself I've seen where buddies of mine who swear by it, their bud is just no good to smoke. Mm. It's big buds, bigger buds than mine, but the weed sucks. Like it just does. There's like no terps to it. It's just Big buds, big flower, mm. a lot of plant material. If you want more plant material, it's great, but I want better weed. Mm. That's why I really focus on the environment. I notice also with low humidity or high humidity, you can potentially, again, I guess, crop steer a little bit in terms of your trichomes. You ever notice that? Dropping that uh, humidity a little bit later in flower. That, I don't know if that's just a bro science thing, but I've noticed it with my plants. Mm. Seems like when you manipulate your humidity or your temperature, that's where you get like that fade potentially, the purple out of your plants. But then what's too far? You know what I'm saying? When do you go too far where it's harmful? Have you ever tried to do any sort of Well, I mean, you're like talking about like dropping the temps at the end of flowering. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you drop it down, lower the temps, the slower the microbes are, right? It's like if you're relying on organics and your medium's too cold, you're not going to really get the, the uptake of nutrients as needed. So, um, you know, a lot of people like to be around room temperature, yeah. 70, you know. Uh, a lot of people like to be in between 72 and 82 Fahrenheit as far as their soil level temperature, which is something we don't, Talk a whole lot about soil temperature. Yeah, the root zone temperature versus the plant, like even the, the surface leaf temperature. There's a your, difference. Your There's a big difference between yeah. the two. Yeah, that's why that's why a lot of people freeze the bottoms off their plants because they keep them on the floor. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. like your room can be 82 and your plants can be dying from freezing. Yeah, because yep. they're on the concrete and their root zone is too cold, too cold, fragile. I think that's a great a uh, great point there too, because like you just talk on room temperature, but not even necessarily plant temperature itself. Mm. And that's where some people have like an infrared gun to actually see on their leaves the actual temperature. Yep. And then in your root system, be I'm assuming a comparable thing there, but it'd just be the top, the surface level. So like when you're dealing with something like that, it's not beneficial to drop your temperature when your roots are being affected versus drop the temperature and your flowers being affected. Well, the same idea though, lower the temperature of the or lower the temperature of the room doesn't necessarily mean that we're lowering the temperature of the root zone. Because yeah. you think about it, too, well, like eventually it would. You know, you, there's activity going on in there too, right? There's some some science that's going on inside your soil that's going to be creating some energy, right? That energy is going to produce some level of heat, which is going to be different than the ambient temperature. I don't I, I don't know at what point, how long you have to say after five days. That's when it equals out or something. You know, I, I'm not sure, but. Yeah, definitely. There's an advantage to manipulating your environment, you know, and, and to to get to get better results. And yeah, I, I've I, I've lowered my temperatures later in flower. I like the color that comes out of them. I do think that the extra stress. This is why I train my plants too. I do feel like the extra stress is 
at a point advantageous to the growth of your plants. Uh, but I do think it's a fine line. It's a fine line. I, I think that a lot of things that we do towards the end of harvest is kind of pointless. Um, bro science rituals. A lot of bro mm, science that know. goes on. But, yeah. but you know, and, and science will come out in due time. But just to kind of get back to the, uh, you at the very beginning of this, Epi asked us what was our, what was our, our preferred temperature and humidity. Mm. And I think, I know, I, I, I know amongst myself, I think one of the most overrated or underrated aspects of garden is humidity. Mm. I really, and I, and this is, I, I kind of speak of myself on this because I overlooked humidity for so long because I, I didn't use a tent. I was using a massive room and the idea of manipulating the uh, humidity in a big room is, you know, it, it's unlikely, mm. especially if it's not sealed. So I never really have manipulated my my humidity. Now that I'm in a tent, I'm seeing huge differences that I can actually keep the humidity at a nice, healthy level. Now, I I prefer a range in humidity throughout the entirety of the grow. Um, I find seedlings and clones, they're going to want a much higher humidity. And I mean high. That's why I dome them. You know, and so like I, I want 90% humidity on my clones. But I don't want my entire tent to be 90% because then it's going to be sweating. Yeah. So I, I'm nice and high, you know, as it becomes a seedling or as it gets, you know, I'm going to lower it down a little bit, you know, 70s through veg. And then as you get a little bit later, you know, early flower, later flower, you're going to start to decrease it even more, ensuring that you're not going to get too much moisture building up between the buds. You know, uh, you know it, somewhere in around that 40% is where I enjoy mine, late flower. And then temperatures is uh, around the same, actually. It's, you know, or hot, high as you uh, are, are younger. Uh, veg, I always like to think, are seedlings. They like to be embraced in a nice warm hug. So they like the nice warm temperatures, the, the mid-80s, 80s to mid-80s. What's that in Celsius? <laughs> Not a clue, man. We doesn't grow in Celsius. <laughs> oh, I, thought uh, you were, I thought you were Canadian. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yeah. All the resources to grow this beautiful plant of ours is American. <laughs> and I've been, I've been trying to research this plant since like 2008. <laughs> it's all fine at Fahrenheit all over the place, huh? Freedom units everywhere. Freedom man. units everywhere. So, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. I, I have a T-shirt on my website that says, uh, weed doesn't grow in Celsius. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, that's a good one. It's crazy, man. Like, I remember finding the forums back in the day, and, like, that's all you'd find is Celsius because it's, like, all these people from, like, the U.K. or Amsterdam Canada. underground growers. Yeah. In Canada, yeah. Underground growers, people from, like, BC and stuff. I don't know oh, yeah. anything else in Fahrenheit. I know nothing. I only know how to grow weed in Fahrenheit. <laughs> Just like, I don't, I'm not it. really like a grams, you know, I don't, weight <laughs> measurement is not my thing, but once I put it into weed, I'm like, oh yeah, it's quarter of an ounce. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> seven grams. Yeah. 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 I need seven grams of sugar in my baking. This like, I'm bread. trying to get an eighth of an ounce, 3.5. <laughs> oh. hmm. I'm going to really know your measurement. You said drugs would help with my math. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> I think when when you look at like uh, the overall temperature and humidity, like mine varies per genetics, but I've got so many different cultivars that I've been growing now that I'm trying to stick with certain ones that I do pretty much the same range as Pete. Mm. Only thing I'd vary in is my seedlings. I don't have a dome that I'm doing. I just spray the hell out of them pretty consistently with water. Yep. Right now I'm using the uh, PetroTool Flogger, which is using real nice little mini. Is that Ben's? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that thing just Ben, oh, wow. man. Shout yeah. Ben. We've partied with that guy. Uh, yeah, that guy, man. Cool. Shout out Ben. It was a, yeah. it was a blast. Um, that thing's working great. I just keep moist there. It's more manual labor doing that versus having the dome. So I might switch to that. It's just it's so easy, man. And the reason I say the dome is because that, that moisture retains for hours, yeah. bro. Whereas like versus you know, I have to go in there every couple of hours. Day. Yeah, 25 times a day. Yeah. 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 I, I have to go in. The dome doesn't alleviate going in there. You know, if you're, you just need to, something you need to take into consideration if you're going to be doing seedlings, it's a little more, it's a little more meticulous. You are yeah. going to be in your garden a couple times a day and that's to keep them moist. Mm. Well, like that's where the like, humidifier is great. I love uh, AC Infinity's new humidifier. That's awesome yeah, too. Yeah, good. Downside with a lot of people that they don't seem to realize is you don't just use regular tap water. Unless you want to have a buildup of calcium all over your tent. Yeah, good point. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's a horrible look. And if you just glance it with no glasses like I did, you may mistake it for powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. Got to be careful. Mm -hmm. And so that and humidity. And that's with any humidifier. That's using yeah, any just, humidifier. Uh, Definitely uh, not JC's. Yeah. <laughs> just to be clear. Now, my biggest gripe with uh, the humidifier in there is unless you do have something like AC Infinity's side, they're not that accurate with shutting off because it doesn't have the whole temperature or humidity of your right. room. Mm -hmm. It just has like that roundabout little area unless you spend a lot of money on them. Ones I've had over the years have been really like uh, 
I wouldn't say like just medical style. Like one's like desktop, you know, those little ones. So now I'm really trying to focus on quality humidifiers because just like with the dome, it's like if you don't just put that in place initially, you'll see it later in your room that you slacked. And for me, spraying every time isn't the best option. Especially if you have a perpetual grow. I don't have, uh, you know. Time. Time is a major factor. And also I don't have just one room. I've got my bedroom that has teens and has babies and seedlings and everything. So if I'm in there just going hog wild and spraying everything down when they kind of need to t- change the humidity as they're hardening off into flower, mm. I'm shooting myself in the foot. So I'm really trying to dial in that space of my seedlings and my propagation center versus the full vegging because then my humidity can be dialed in exactly. Especially, again, using a quality humidifier if you need the heater, air conditioner, depending on in your room. But trying to do too much in one space and changing it for different like stages of the garden is stupid. I've done it way too long. And no, it's just, you can make it work, but it's like, wow, it's difficult. Huge advantage to your environment is having multiple, env- or to your garden is having multiple environments. Yeah. You know, multiple S- tents. Certain stages just for that particular You've got area. How many tents? Two. Two? Yep. And and that that alone makes a huge difference. Just two. Because you have a veg and a flower room, you know? And then there's an argument that three is nice and someone will say four, you know what I mean? But it's yeah. it's having that where you can, you know, move them over to say, okay, so much, you know, the I'm going to have my humidity a little bit higher in here because it's veg, a little bit lower in here because I'm moving into flower now. And yeah, the tents for environments was game. I was just going to say, that's where the tents come into play for me, man. Like I used to be the anti-tent guy, but I can really guarantee I'm going to have a better setup here versus in another one, whether I'm using, you know, a... Uh, just a regular system or I've optimized it properly. I'm using like negative air pressure in the tent even, and I'm really dialing my whole space in. I can't do that in an open room. Like I, I, I'm not a Rob Vila type of cat, no fucking Rob Allen. You know, I'm not out here trying to home improvement it. So most times oh, when I've oh, built my oh, rooms, you know, <laughs> they're like that. It looks like Tim Allen's and I needed more of his buddy, the, the guy with the little mustache to come in there and make it right. Mine have always Al. been Al. Al did it right, man. I needed an Al because I was always just like, him and it's always messed up and i'm like wow my temperature changes quite a bit what's going on in here i'm like huh, i put my hand right here and i feel air probably a natural occurrence not me i didn't do that it wasn't it wasn't my human air as we're a tent only a cheap tent do i have that issue yeah i've bought like a zazzy tent on amazon is what it's called it works but there's a million holes in there it's like somebody took it and poked holes in a condom type of thing like what is all the Spaces literally, if you turn on the light, and shut off the lights in the room. Yeah, you see like a million little holes in there. And like, I didn't have light leak issues, but I had lack of control in my environment. I had all this open area, like, there's no nothing there that's helping. You could feel air coming out of the thing. What the hell is this? So, having a quality tent again, AC Infinity's tent, Gorilla has a good tent. Um, I run the Spider brands. Farmer tent. Spider no, Farmer has I a good really, tent. I really like it. Yep. Make sure you're buying the quality tent because if you do use that, not all of them are built the same, just like a greenhouse. You have a, a quality built greenhouse or a cheapy little Amazon tent type of thing. It's not the same grow. It's okay. The same setup. I'll pose, I'll pose one for you. Light leaks. Myth or legit? Yeah, I mean, I've had issues with, yeah. with light leaks. And yeah. one interesting one in particular is my humidifier, the, like the light, the LED light that's on there mm-hmm. was on during the dark period and the plants directly next to it permed. Permed out. It's like just a clear visual right then well, and there consistent you know amount and the other too. ones that were on the other side of the room no didn't. problem you see know? i think people get too caught up on that where it's like if they got if they open the tent and there's light on they're like oh I'll turn a green light on oh, instead of just getting in the tent for a second doing it i think it's that consistent light in there like that was in there every night for the whole grow just on it you know it's like yeah, versus just once or twice a little bit of light quick peek into there that's not going to ruin your garden i've seen people freak well, out I, about again that. i i i it's a kind of you know, or cultivar specific, you know, I think a week, someone that's a, 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 a cultivar that's not hardy enough to take that kind of abuse, you know, to me, um, a pineapple express or, um, or, uh, an AK 47 for me, those are very like, I don't know if it's my environment. I, I don't know what it is. They're the only two plants I've ever had that have hermied on me. And it's something that I've kind of, I've struggled with where it's like, what was it? You know, was it was it possible that it was a light leak? Was it something that I did? You know, I'm I'm curious about that. But yeah, light leaks I think is something that's that is is somewhat important, obviously. Um, but I don't think you should be losing sleep over it. But yeah. but the reality is is that the 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 phot- or what is it the the cells on the plant are going to react to the photons. As soon as the photons hit the plant, they're reacting to that light. You know, it's how much do they react? So. 
is it going to be enough to cause issues? Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I've never had issues with light leaks. No. Yeah, me neither. I've yeah. had shitty zippers yeah. and all sorts of stuff. I've never had issues there. Congratulations. <laughs> Fuck you and you. It's like people say, like, I've never had mice. Oh, I'm like, yeah, get out of my house. I, I've also had issues where leaving like the lung room light on. Oh, and yeah, then yeah. so like it leaks into the tent. Right. And it's like, <sighs> yeah, that's that messed up my plans before. Well, that's what I was saying. I think the consistent amount of light there versus just light. Yeah, it was on overnight. It's like, yeah, yeah. and you're having it overnight and it could be multiple times even. Like, didn't even realize through the grow it was three times and that's yeah. a total of like 60 hours of time. You know, it's like that's a fair amount of exposure. Mm -hmm. Versus two minutes of opening up to show a buddy real quick. I think I think it's also really important to like mention what makes your environment easier. Because I until I quit saying it, but until I got a smart controller for my room, mm. I was constant every night I'd never know what was gonna happen. You know, I, I didn't know if I was gonna wake up and it would just be ninety in there. I didn't know if I was gonna wake up and it'd be dry, you know, and but Having a smart controller that regulates the temperature, regulates the humidity, regulates the lighting. I don't have to. I don't have to worry about anything. I just go check the meter. Okay, check, check, check. Okay, done. You yeah. know uh, that that's that's a huge advantage. Huge advantage. I'm not going to have to go in there every day. Well, you don't you don't have to go in there every day. You can just check your meter, see what's going on, and you're set. Um, that was a huge advantage. Having a system that entirely works for me. Rather than me working for the tent. Well, especially like the old Frankenstein system like most of us had with a little dial oh. um, timer and like some random little thermohygrometer and like five other random things put together and hoping that it works. You're like, oh, this is this is choice. This is great. Variable like, speed controller on yeah. the fan. You're like trying yeah. to tinker it to dial it in. And exactly, exactly. Temperature swings and humidity swings like crazy. And, and then all of a sudden you'll put two thermohygrometers next to each other and they're different. You're like, <laughs> which one's right? <laughs> you know? Like that's that's where centralizing the technology is really good. If you don't have you know the funds for like a Titan controller or something like that to run everything and really ball out, the best next best in my opinion, thousand percent non biased AC Infinity killing it with the controllers because mm -hmm. it's too complicated to try to wire this stuff up. You can be somebody like Goblin. Shout out Green Goblin Five Ten. He made his own complicated system, but as soon as he started explaining it, I was like, shut the f up and quit talking to me about this. It's so complicated. Like, no, I'm gonna spend a hundred dollars. Or two hundred dollars even, and save myself two hundred hours. No, thank you. Like, <laughs> Rain Man ass. No. So, but if you if your engineer son, like, build it yourself, do it yourself. But for the rest of us, man, that's a game changer. I've always wanted the. Uh, we were just talking about them, the pulse. That was one I wanted, but I just couldn't justify for it. Just having a couple little things, you know. I'm like, CO two, that's it. You know, like that's not VPD, that's it. You know, and I know those are very, very important things. But Power meter on one of them, too. Yeah, see, well, that's when bucks. you... Yeah, 500. I was just going to say, you want to put the money out there. So, like, the technology has been there, but to make it so it's affordable for us homegrowers to be able to have it without, you know, breaking the bank. Ten years ago, it makes sense when everybody's selling their shit out there for $200 a piece or more. Totally get it. For, for Z, we'll just say. Nowadays? Hell no. No way. And, and the tax, the green tax, we'll say, as soon as it's cannabis-related, then oh, there's an issue there. But as soon as it's related to that, there's a problem. You get charged more. When it's not that at all, it's affordable. A lot of this technology has been around for agriculture, but just not for our plant. Right. Once our plant's got it, now it costs more. Mm. What the heck? Okay. I think it's... Were you going to say something? I was going to talk about the AC Infinity monitor. One thing real quick is one thing I wish they had, which actually I didn't download the new firmware, so maybe it's included, but you can't get notifications to your phone, right? So like if something's out of range, temperature goes too high, can't get that notification to your phone, right? Hmm. Uh, like I thought you, you can. Yeah, like you, like as a. Oh, did they add that? Will it say? Well, like you're out of no, range. Oh yeah, see, I don't yeah. get. A notification it doesn't like do that. that. No. no, my my meter. Mine shows it on my thing. There, yeah, it shows yeah. it. But you're right. But it you don't get, actually get a notification on your phone. Right. So. It's too high. Yeah. That would be no. a good yeah. thing. Yeah. But it's I do know a thing to go off to be like, hey, check your the pro. Room. The pro, it's which doesn't help if you're not at home. But the if there's an issue, if you're outside of your range, because you can set the range. It sends off. It sounds off an alarm. Mm. You've heard your alarm or no? Uh, yeah. Boop. I don't really use the alarm mode. I use that other Boop. mode where oh. you set the high and low. Highs well, it's infinity yeah, if you're yeah, watching. Yeah, I, I, I set infinity. Too, Sydney, you infinity set if you're alarm. watching. It, it just, I must have the alarm on. Yeah, I'm not sure. But uh, notifications and notifications. a five-gallon tank for the humidifier. 
<laughs> oh yeah, a bigger one. I, I, sorry, a bigger one would be something? badass. Go ahead. No, no, no. I don't remember. I was joking. <laughs> uh, I think it's. I think it's important too, though. I do. I do think it's important too, though, that like, you know, not everybody has a million dollars to go spend on some of this equipment. Like, oh, I, yeah. I love AC Infinity, but when I first started, man, I couldn't afford squat. So some DIYs, real quick. You know, it's like if someone's if it's really dry, what would be a what would be a an affordable DIY to add some humidity to your tent? I got one right off the top of my head. I used to put towels, that's wet towels, <laughs> wet yeah. towel, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. They dry so quick when it's really yeah, good. Really dry yeah, they do dry out like, pretty quick. People put down in an hour. buckets of water in there. Wick it. Wicking, yeah, yeah the wicking. Yeah. I'd set a too. towel like that in a five gallon bucket, and I'd have them both on both sides. And it would be dry in the center. And by the time I come down, the buckets were almost empty. And the middle was wet and the sides weren't. Mm. Like it would happen all the time. It was total ghetto, but it worked. Yep. Pretty, and I have to put a fan near it sometimes too. Oh, uh, yeah. Didn't blow it, you know? Yep. yep. F- uh, uh, I was adding a fan in front yeah. of a bowl of water even helps just to get yeah, some. in comparison to not evap. doing anything. Yep, exactly. Um, it's funny. Um, okay, so that's good. Humidif- humidifier. I think most people can do that. What about air conditioning? Uh, okay, I got one for that. Um, I actually watched. Shout out to uh, M and NV Med Grower. If I'm NV not, Closet Med Grower. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, he put out a video, and this we're going. We're pushing eight, ten years ago. <laughs> he, no, yeah, probably. Anyways. How to grow series that he has. Well, he no, okay. pro- it might have been in it, but uh, it was a how to create uh, an air conditioner, or what well, you said, air conditioner. He took um, ice, and he put ice inside of a uh, like a a, a cooler. And like an igloo cooler, lifted the lid, filled it with ice, drilled two, well, I guess he, before he filled it with ice, he drilled two big holes on each side, pump, put um, uh, ducting on one side, ducting on the other, and blew a fan hmm. through the ice. Exactly. And he said he was able to lower his temperature by, if I'm like 10 degrees hmm. by doing this. Now, they've got you, ones that sit on five gallon buckets so you can fill with ice and they're fans. That I see for like factories and stuff that they use to literally take a Home Depot bucket, fill it with ice, and it's got like a top that has a fan. Oh, that like mm. yeah, yeah, they're pretty dope okay. actually. Yeah, so there's so, a lot of innovative things you could do like that, but that's that almost sounds more innovative, right? So, <laughs> so one way to cool it, like if you're in a tent, a lot of people would like just open a vent. You know, like there's a lot of vents on your tent. Intake and outtake, fresh air, and it, like even sometimes when it's hotter outside, you think if it's consistently moving. That air is not stagnant. You can still, I guess, get away with certain things like higher humidity and temperature because it's not just stagnantly in there. It's an exchange of air, yeah. fresh and stagnant. Yeah. But you can get away with hotter tough. temperature with a fan, like just moving air. Yeah, moving the air you is can, important. Yeah. yeah. You but can, if your humidity is crazy high, you got to somehow be pumping that out. You know yeah, because that's, that's when you get toughest. into real okay, hot so water, red powdery mildew, bud rot, you know, if they're like, especially with the stagnant air as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so humidity is really high. What do you do? You lower it. Ah. <laughs> Dehumidifier is what a lot of people use, right? Dehumidifiers, which are costly. Um, so we're putting wet towels in to moisten the environment. What about dry towels? Dry towels. Put, put dry towels. Put a bunch of bread in it. <laughs> soak up a bunch of bread. A bunch of bread. Um, that's going to add a little bit of possible mold in there. Yeah. I would, I would oh, yeah. um, but air circulation would be my biggest one for too much humidity. That's all I've been that's, able to do. Yeah, I've, I've literally know. added an, an extra inline fan to suck the shit out. Yeah. But that's increased my electricity bill and it's one of those things where like, actually I just got a dehumidifier. Mm. Like, you know, the problem is a dehumidifier that's quality uh, is just usually expensive. The ones who aren't, you who aren't, that aren't quality will usually have a flood in your grow because they don't have a proper drainage system. You have to make one yourself and DIY it, which can suck but like i've had some before where i've gone in my room and it's been flooded from a dehumidifier <laughs> like oh my god yep. you have to have a drain for that and, and i wouldn't skimp that's one of the few things depending on where you live if you got high humidity don't skimp on a dehumidifier mm. it's worth it's worth spending the money yep. you can't afford it right away get a harvest under your belt maybe the next run but that's one thing that i i i'd say I overlooked for the longest time was a dehumidifier like, I'll just increase the inline fan. I'm like, man, my electricity bill is nuts. I should have just bought an efficient You're piece of technology. The holes in your yeah. Just sucking the yeah, holes. Just, you open it up and you can feel it just, it's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> calm down. But you got to do what you got to do. You know, in a situation where, like I said in the beginning of the episode, the fluctuating temperature, if you don't have a humidifier and a dehumidifier, you're screwed in one of the two seasons. So there's some people who are seasonal growers. Just for that reason alone. Yep. So they never season. see summertime. They'll never do it. Only winter growing. Yeah, I like to not grow during like the summer months, July, yeah. August. Well, you got crazy heat and low humidity. 
Yeah. That sucks. It gets really tough. Yeah, so but then your your electricity bill makes it so is it worth it? You're almost literally almost better off to just like hibernate. There's no seasons. Yeah, if I grew more plants, it would be worth it. You know what I mean? We're talking about a high value crop, but like me, I'm just a small home grower, so it's like yeah, I mean the cost goes up, right? It's not just yeah. the lighting, but now you're spending money on cooling as well. So it's like and if for me, I, like I can get away with too. not doing it. I'm just a small home grower. Okay, if I can take those two months off, rest of the year I just grow and I'm good, you know. Yeah. It's all about kind of growing to what you're supplying yourself, you know, or like I'm, I'm fortunate enough to live in a state where I can gift, you know, so I have friends, family that come into town. There we go. Gifting them. Yep. So I think I factor that into my grow, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Well, like, I feel like as now you're doing the, the breeding too. So you got, you know, you chill out OGs. A little bit, a little bit here. Well, not every run is going to be one that you're looking at for a successful flower harvest. You're looking at it to get, to see how your plant's growing, you know? So like. You may have a season where you're almost low on flour because of that. Uh, that happened to me last year. You know? <laughs> yeah, and and that's where those the argument of the perpetual grow comes in. But then when you look at your costs and you know your ROI, essentially, that whether it's just smoking it or you're selling it, whatever you're doing, you have to look at it from a realistic standpoint because adding all this electricity or equipment to your room increases that cost per gram or per pound, whatever you're trying to do there. Mm. So is it worth just playing the system in terms of the seasons in in your environment or fighting against it? I think that's where it's like you're really about this life and you're really into the, the grow, you'll do what you got to do. You'll get to live through it. But some people, it's just easier to shut it down. You know, I think that with the, the evolution of technology that we're getting, everything's smart, everything's efficient in terms of electro- electricity, and the electronics are more optimized for, uh, let's say, integration with other stuff. Nowadays, it may be more logical to buy this stuff. But like five, 10 years ago, you know, you're spending three, four hundred dollars on your know, humidifier or dehumidifier for a quality one, for not just a little desktop one or a little, uh, like one for when you're sick. But now we've got so many things that are canna specific, we'll say, that are designed for the plant. So you're going to get the best bang for your buck. So sometimes adding that to your garden is worth it if you're trying to have good smoke. I personally, I smoke so damn much, I'm going to keep adding to my garden when I need mm-hmm. to. But not everybody smokes like that. So I think it's the give and take, finding the ebb and flow in your own grow. And knowing that, like, if you don't dial that environment and you may as well just, again, kiss that good genetic goodbye because there's no reason to even bring it into your room to just suffocate it, torture it, right. drown it with humidity. You know, yeah. like, and it's do also, it the right way. It's also important to note, too, it's like uh, regardless, let's say you got your, your uh, humidities dialed in, your temperatures dialed in, which leads to your VPD, uh, you've got everything's going right. That still doesn't mean that you're going to avoid bugs. Mm. Uh, Bugs are a massive part of your environment. There's going to be bugs in your garden whether you like it or not. You know, we've all pests. seen bugs, pests. Well, there's, I'm, I want to be honest, I want to be talking about both because we've all been in our garden and we've seen like a wolf spider. You guys go big spiders and shit down here, hey? Like that, and I, I leave them. I don't touch that. Mm-hmm. The, I do too, yeah. I, leave I think that they're going to fight for me. you darn right. <laughs> he's, he, he, he's in there. And nobody else is. Like yeah. he's gonna fend me off. It's gonna end up in your mouth while you're sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, go your nose. He ain't <laughs> he's being fed. He's being fed yeah, in the tent. Well, it's going after the warmth, right? It's yeah. calling you. Goes so it's a warm mouth. They actually say that's Don't a myth. They, is it? Yeah. They, they uh, well, the, the statistic was is you I don't trust swallow they. twelve spiders a year. <laughs> really? In a, in a year, but then it was like twelve over a lifetime. Oh, uh, okay. And yeah, interesting. Still, still nasty as all heck. But, who are uh, they though? And I don't trust they? they. Spider swallowers. <laughs> Spider swallowers. Yeah, um, that makes I, sense. I think it's oh, important man. to keep your environment clean. Yeah. Because, like, again, you can a humidity, VPD, temperature dialed in, perfect. But if you're trudging your outdoor boots through your garden, if you're going and spending time with your dogs and going into your garden, or the cats and going in the garden, or your iguanas, and you're going in the garden. You, uh, in the garden. You, you you really need to make sure that you're making the steps necessary. To keep it clean because I like I always say routine is huge. If you can get into the garden first thing in the morning, you're less likely to have these bugs, the 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 hair and you've already showered, you know. So keep your environment clean, you know, wash wash your tents after each cycle. Um I, you know, wash it down top to bottom, you know, keep a good IPM routine i train to avoid bugs you know no bottom part portions of my plant when that too high humidity those uh yeah. spider mites will come in there just ready to dance and hang out too you yeah know? so like you can literally have an environment that's optimized for pests <laughs> by by not taking care of business you know what i'm saying 
Yep. So like Stay it goes vigilant. in both ways. Where Stay it's like, vigilant. Yeah, if you're not on top of it, when you do introduce the accidental pests into your room, if you've got the perfect environment for them, they're going to thrive. thrive. They're yeah. going to thrive. And they're going to take over. And it's yeah. going to seem like you're just infested and you're screwed. Well, you literally made them the best bed they can get. Yep. And you say, right. come on in and snuggle. You know? Yep. I think that that's the, the overlook of the humidity and temperature and the overall environment. People think it's just to get bigger buds or just this or that. Like, my plant's still green and looking good. It's like, well, wait until later in flower. Then usually you see all the bad shit, but you can end up having these things like powdery mildew you don't even see for a long time. You know, uh, you could have root aphids or you could have uh, gnats or, or rips. mites. Rips. rips is another one. That all these things hides. that are loving your shitty environment because you've been like, my plant's green, it's good. I don't need to use all this stuff. But then it's, it could be a perpetual negative thing where the next grow has these same issues and the next grow has these same Like That's the stuff that in the past for me has haunted me where I'm like, no, we'll just kill them and start over. And I'm like, damn it, we still got mites. You know, it's because I didn't change my room up. My environment was no better. Yeah. You know, I'm literally creating the most hospitable place for a pest to live. And I think that for me is my biggest focus with the environment. It's like powdery mildew or pests. If I'm not on top of it, that's my worry. If I kick ass, my plants are going to crush it. Mm. But the other side, I'm ruining it. So I have to make sure it's dialed in. Like I've never been a slacker on the environment other than when I first, first started and I was ignorant. Now, like... I'm, I'm so anal about even the littlest bit of dirt or the humidity getting fluctuations. Like, why? I don't even use. Why is it doing this? I don't even use my household cleaning equipment. Yeah, I've got grow house. cleaning stuff just for the. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. The rag Room doesn't touch other things. For the garden. Yeah. And, yeah. I think it's uh, mandatory, man. Yeah. You going to say so? Yeah. Well, I was going to say we have a whole episode on IPM. So yeah, uh, but, that's probably a good transition. And in order to get to that episode next, IPM, I know you also mentioned kind of the routine in the garden. We have an episode on that as well. Mm-hmm. So I definitely recommend you guys check that out. But uh, I want to know in the comment section, your environment, like what did we miss here? We were kind of looking back at 2020. I know there's some things we repeated. I know that for a fact. I know there's a lot of things that we talked about that are actually different. I was kind of surprised by the amount of things that we've talked about that were a little bit different. I wasn't you know? even in a tent two years ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. I know. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Too. You have a that alone. completely different. Totally growth. different. It's completely different. It, it, game changing. Even in terms so, of your environmental control, you weren't rocking the controllers or nothing. Really, no, right? I was against yeah. it. Yeah. 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 So it'll be interesting to see the difference between that episode and this episode. We want to yeah. hear from you guys. If you guys want to check out us on Twitch, we do record live episodes over there. Twitch.tv slash from the stash. Uh, don't forget, those are every Thursday, 2 p.m., 1 p.m. Central, 2 Eastern, and 11 Pacific. We're going to give a huge shout-out to AC Infinity for helping support this show and this podcast, supporting us and uh, you guys for being here for every episode. We want to hear from you guys, so please, if you like the episode, leave a like, subscribe, and leave a comment in the comment section yeah. below. But if you're listening on uh, Spotify, iTunes, anywhere like that, we appreciate you taking the time let us get in your ear yeah if you don't mind leaving a review too if you listen to apple music or uh uh, spotify uh reviews on audio platforms are huge that's one of the biggest paybacks you can for us shout out to everybody who does subscriptions on twitch and buys our merch and everything but helping to push the message so we can vibe with more you guys more stashers and be able to build this community that's one of the biggest payments we can get so really appreciate everybody there and uh yeah, if you're not smoking, you should because we're gonna go smoke here in a minute. We're definitely token smoke. after these. Uh, yeah. we'll, we'll be doing those live on Twitch too. Um, don't forget, you can visit us on uh, fromthestash.com. A huge shout out to AC Infinity. Huge shout out to the man behind the scenes, yeah, Wink's the best kiss. looking of us all, uh, Wink. <laughs> uh, huge shout out on behalf of myself, Pigeons Four Twenty, Mister Grow It, and Rob from CLTV. This is from the stash. Peace out, boys. Peace and girls. <laughs>